So for tonight's discussion, tonight's lecture, we're going to be talking about when you arrive at a scene, what are going to be your job responsibilities? And we're also going to talk about from the perspective of a crime scene photographer, because that's what we're going to focus on. You're the photographer. Um, how do you photograph the scene? What should you take pictures of? How many pictures should you take? What sequence should you take them in? That's really what our discussion is going to be about tonight. All right. So the first question I want to ask, and this question might show up on your final exam. Why do we take crime scene photos? Or in other words, the way it might be worded on an exam might be, what useful purpose do crime scene photos serve? What are they used for? What do we, I mean, we take pictures, right? What are we going to do with them? Court. All right, we could use them in court, right? So uh, if we want to show the jury what the crime scene looked like or what the weapon looked like. Examples of some pretty gruesome photos that showed up in court. If you remember the Jody Arias trial, remember she uh, was accused and then ultimately convicted of murdering her boyfriend, Travis Alexander. There were some pretty brutal photos uh, at that crime scene that were shown there to the jurors for everybody to see right there in the court. So in one of the useful purposes is to show the jury the crime scene. That's one useful purpose. Why else? Why else would you take pictures? Um, for, um, in investigating and to find yeah, so sometimes the, the photos can provide leads or clues. So maybe during the initial crime scene processing steps. Maybe there was something that we didn't pick up on, but then a later go through of the photos reveals some detail that we might have missed. So it, pro it might provide more uh, leads that we didn't have the first time. All right, other ones, and those are good ones, uh, they're used especially to refresh the memory of the investigator when they go to court. Uh, right now, uh, so here, what, here in uh, May or Actually, we're in April still. April 2018. I don't know if you've been listening, but uh, there was a Border Patrol agent um, who uh, has been on trial for a shooting that took place in 2012. So uh, it was an issue where there was a young man from Mexico that was throwing rocks across the border at Border Patrol agents, and the Border Patrol agent shot through the fence that made up the border wall at that spot and shot and killed that, I think he's about 16 year old young man. When did that happen? 2012. It's 2018 today. That was six years later. So think about it, if you're a crime scene investigator, you're gonna process, every year, you're gonna process hundreds of scenes. And if we're talking six years later, you processed 600 different crime scenes before this particular case goes to court. So if you're asked questions about that case, are you going to remember every detail about it? No. No. But the good thing is in your case notes, you're going to have those photos to help refresh your memory. Uh, they're used to help refresh the memory of the perpetrator. So maybe the perpetrator, maybe during questioning they can't remember something. You could show them a crime scene photo. Sometimes they're used to get the perpetrator to confess to the crime. For example, you might have a, a husband who comes home and finds his wife in bed with another man. He goes into a rage and murders the, the wife and her lover. And then later on, when this person is confronted during interrogation, the officer shows the, 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 the husband the photo of his murdered wife, and that produces enough guilt in him to, to actually confess. There's a lot of really useful purposes for crime scene photos. All right. Let's talk a little bit about just crime scenes in general. First of all, uh, we're going to focus primarily our discussion on you being a crime scene investigator, right? So uh, are you typically the first person on scene if you're a crime scene investigator? No. No. There's usually a lot of other people that are there first, right? Typically the first person on scene is the first responding officer. Typically it's a patrol officer, a beat officer, right? So we have a, a complainant who makes a phone call to, this, to 911 and then dispatch sends an officer to respond. So we have a first responding officer. They roll up on scene. What is their primary duty when they roll up on scene? So let's say we have a homicide. We had someone who got shot. Someone's laying on the ground there, bleeding, maybe dead, maybe not, not sure. 
Right? What's their first responsibility? Oh, to create a perimeter. It's security. not to secure the scene. If, if you've got a, a, a person that's injured, you've got to take care of the injuries. That's right. So the very first thing we do is we handle emergencies. All right. So if we have, if, if there is a individual there bleeding, and we're not sure if they're dead or not yet, we probably want to make sure, right? Um, and if they are still alive, I'm not going to be throwing up crime scene tape <laughs> while that person's bleeding. I'm going to make sure I'm making a phone call to get the emergency medical personnel there to be able to deal with the injured person. If the perpetrator's still there waving a gun around, I'm not going to throw crime scene tape up then. Again, you handle emergencies first, right? If it means that we're, we're tracking that, we're running down the perpetrator because they're still there, we're detaining them, or we're helping someone who's injured. Now, once we've dealt with the emergencies, the next step, which you guys said, is to secure the scene. Right? Let's talk about securing the scene. First of all, very likely test question on the final name. Three or four things you could use to secure a crime scene. What's an obvious one? It's in the picture right behind me here. Crime scene, crime scene tape. We've all seen it a million times on TV and movies, right? So you can certainly secure the scene with crime scene tape. But what if you don't have crime scene tape? What else could you use to secure the scene? Rope? I've never seen duct tape used before, but I can't really try it. Um, sometimes you just use, uh, just have officers. They're patrolling the outside of the scene, making sure people are not entering the scene. So it could just be you, you put officers at entrances and not allow people in. If your crime scene's outdoors, it's not uncommon just to put squad cars across roadways to make sure people can't come in. Flares, cones, whatever you need to do to be able to demonstrate that this area is off limits. Now, how big of an area do you need to secure? Because as a crime scene tech, that actually, you actually might need to help secure a scene. Typically, it's already secured before you get there. But if you were called up fast enough and you were on scene, you might have to help secure the scene. How big of an area do you secure? It depends on the crime. It does depend on the crime. Any area that might have evidence needs to be secured. So just because there was a shooting that happened inside the person's home, that doesn't mean we only secure the home. Because the person had to get in the home, and they flee from the home, right? So the, the, the entire yard should be secured. Who knows? There, maybe as they were fleeing from the police, they were firing at the, at the police, and so we have cartridge casings that are ejected on the street. Any area where there might be evidence, we need to secure that area in some way, shape, or form. Are we going to put the crime scene tape around all of that? I don't know. But we need to find a way to secure it. Technically, when we secure a scene, we're going to create two perimeters. This is important. There's two perimeters. We have an inner perimeter and an outer perimeter. So I'm going to draw on the board as just two squares. We have our inner perimeter, one square, the inner square. And then outside of that, we have another square, which is what we're going to call our outer perimeter. So we're technically securing two areas. The more secure area is the inner perimeter. And what is inside the inner perimeter, that inner square? Anything that could have evidence in it. This is really our crime scene. The crime scene is really within the inner perimeter. So, for example, if this was a residential home, inside the inner perimeter we probably have, of course, the house, but also maybe the yard, maybe even the front yard or the street in front of the house. But even beyond that, we're going to create another barrier beyond that, an outer perimeter. So then what we have is between our two perimeters, we have the outer perimeter and the inner perimeter. Again, the crime scene itself lies within the inner perimeter. But then we have this area between the two. We call this a staging zone. Why do we have that outer perimeter, by the way? Who stays outside the outer perimeter? And who's reading? Yeah, anybody who's not going to be involved in the scene. So this is media. This is the citizens, right? Uh, it could even be, you know, family members. We, anybody that we just do not want in the scene at all. That's correct. It could also be additional officers. All right, the staging area, which is, again, the area between the inner perimeter and the outer perimeter. We have the staging area. That's where we're going to set up our equipment. Right, that's where we're going to create a, a scene plan, a strategy. Because we don't want to be doing that inside the scene, because we could be contaminating the scene by doing it. We're, we're making preparations. So who exists in, the, in that staging area? Well, your crime scene investigators will be there. 
your first responding officer, whoever's in charge of the scene, keep in mind it could be the first responding officer, or it could be someone from the investigative division, so it could be a detective, for example. You might even have attorneys there. If it's a very big case that has uh, some large ramifications, it's not uncommon to have someone from the county attorneys or the district attorneys or the, the, the federal attorney's offices come. Think about, we've had some serial crimes here in Phoenix the last little while, right? We had the serial shooter out in Maryville, right? We had the, the freeway shooters uh, a few years ago. Uh, we've had our fair share. We had the baseline killer. If we, if we have a crime scene, and we're pretty sure it's linked to some other cases, that's going to draw a lot of attention. So there's a lot of people. Now, once the scene has been secured, inner and outer perimeters have been set up. Who's the first person who enters the inner perimeter after it's been set up? It's the photographer. The first person who should enter the scene once it's been set up is going to be the photographer, or it should be. Now, it's important you guys understand that tonight, I'm going to be lecturing on what are best practices, meaning that if you can do this, this is really how it should be done. But it's important to understand that Every crime scene is a little bit different, and so you have to make changes based on the situation, right? Sometimes there's rushes that need to happen. For example, if, you're, if your crime scene is on the middle of the freeway, if we have I-10 shut down because there's a crime scene on the freeway, we may alter the, the speed at which we process or the sequence at which we process. But whenever possible, you should do best practices. Question? How do you deal with... Uh victims that have been taken away because okay. of injury or because of injury we're going to photo we're going to try to capture photographs as much photographic evidence as we can before they go now they're going to be photographed again potentially at the hospital if they're if they're injured and they're going to be treated keep in mind if it's a decedent someone who's died we're going to talk about that a little later tonight they will be photographed again by the by the medical examiner but it's important if we know that a victim's going to be removed from the scene because they're bleeding and they need to be attended to, really, the photograph should start immediately. So if you're a first responding officer and there's not a crime scene tech there, you should start snapping photos. Or at least at a minimum, if you can't take your photos, you should be keeping handwritten notes saying, you know, what, what, what was the condition of the victim at the time, so, so on and so forth. Is that staging area photographed? Uh, the staging area is not normally photographed, no, because it's, that's, that's not really the scene. Okay, the scene is in within that inner perimeter. All right, so when the crime scene photographer enters the scene first, they are quite often accompanied by whoever's in charge. Let's, let's just say it's a detective who's in charge. So what will typically happen is the crime scene photographer will begin to photograph the scene, and then right next to them is going to be the detective. And the reason for that is the detective is going to begin to develop a scene strategy. How are we going to process this scene? Who's going to do what and in what order? I want to be very clear. Who is in charge at the scene? The police officer, either the detective or the first responding officer. They might not have as much forensic uh, knowledge as you do, but they are in charge. If you are a crime scene investigator there, you are there as forensic science support. You're there to help them do their job. You are not there to take over that scene. That is how most agencies do it. Right, so you're there to help. So let's say you respond in a team of three crime scene investigators. What will typically happen is that detective is going to give each of those investigators a different job. One of them is probably going to do the photography. Another one will probably be bagging and tagging evidence items. Another one may be keeping the notes. Uh, another one may be processing for fingerprints. And then that frees up the detective to do other things. Right? So you're kind of there to help, to support. You don't take control of the scene. That is very different than what you see as you watch television and movies, right? Think about the TV show CSI, which I'm sure we've all seen before, right? You watch CSI, when the CSI show up on, on the scene, right, the, the detectives are like, Ooh, you know, CSI is here and we're going to turn the, the entire scene over to them. That is not how it really happens, right? You're there to provide support. No, with me so far? Okay. 